This is Dr. Roger Green in his teaching on American Christianity. This is session number 20, The Social Gospel in America, Part 2. Okay, I'm on page 15 of the syllabus, so that's where we are, and we're pretty much where we should be. We were talking, first of all, we gave an overview of Walter Rauschenbusch, and you're reading the Evans biography of Rauschenbusch, so have read it probably a couple times now, so that you're familiar with that biography, chapter by chapter. Um, So Walter Rauschenbusch, but very, very, very important person. Uh, in Christianity in America, kind of reshaping some things, um, no doubt about that. Um, so we did a lot on him and uh, on his life and so forth, and we're still at A, we're still at Walter Rauschenbusch and talking about him, and uh, then we'll talk about the theology of the social gospel and then contributions of the social gospel to American Christianity. So that's kind of our line. So what, where we are with Rauschenbusch is we're really at his works, and um, we really, uh, I think we, yeah, I think we, at least we got started talking about Christianity and the social crisis. And uh, let me just, oh, sorry, let me just um, come back here for just a minute. Here are the works, Christianity and the Social Crisis, that he wrote in 1907. Now, you're not going to read Christianity and the Social Crisis this week, probably. Uh, we hope you'll read it this summer. So what I've done with that is given you five basic points um, about Christianity and the Social Crisis. And the last point was, where do we go from here? Isn't that where we stopped? I think it's where we stopped. I don't think we moved. So let's say a couple more things now about the book and about what Rauschenbusch was trying to do in the book. And then we'll journey on to the next book, The Theology of the Social Gospel. But um, we, we, if we didn't mention Christianity in the Social Crisis, 1907, that he really believes um, in the concept of the kingdom of God. That is a central concept for Rauschenbusch in his books, in his writings, in his teaching. And what he is trying to do is he's trying to bring kingdom of God language into the modern world, into the 20th century. He is trying to help the 20th century church understand how the kingdom of God relates now to the 20th century, which, of course, he sees as the central message of Jesus, which it was. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And so Rauschenbusch in the book is trying to recover that great message. So Now, he also believed in the book, the 1907 date is important, he also believes that the church the body of Christ. Now, the church can be instrumental in bringing about the kingdom of God. The church can help to bring about God's kingdom. And, the, the, and partly, it can help by the alleviation of evil in this world, by fighting evil, alle- alleviating evil, and so forth, to help usher in the kingdom of God. So he has a high view of the work of the church. Uh, again, church with a capital C. We mentioned before, mentioned the other day, that uh, when it comes to the work of the church, he sees more democratically oriented churches like the Baptists and the Methodists as more in a position to do that. Because as far as he's concerned, they, the Baptists and the Methodists represent the primitive church most clearly. Uh, so he's uh, he sometimes kind of is a little, gets after a bit the hierarchical churches uh, because they're standing in the way of this kind of democratic impulse in the church as well as in the nation. So so Christianity and the social crisis, the date of the writing um, uh, is, is very important. Okay, one more thing here about the book itself. What Rauschenbusch will try to do in the book and his writings and other books is wed... Um, uh, biblical studies and, or religion and ethics. So biblical studies, religion, ethics, he's trying to bring those all together. He's trying to make those kind of one piece in his teaching. And uh, so he tries to do that in the book. I, if, if any of you had me for the Christian theology course, you know that one of my professors used to say, all good theology ends in ethics. Uh, well, that would be true. That Rauschenbusch would believe that. 
that all good theology ends in ethics. So he tries to see kind of the ethical mandates that are coming out of the biblical record and coming out of religion. So that is really, really important for Rauschenbusch. This, is, if you're going to read one book by Rauschenbusch, this would be the book to read, Christianity and the Social Crisis. We're also going to talk about a second book, a theology for the social gospel. Now, notice when he wrote it, 1917, so we're in the midst, in the throes of World War I during that time, so theology of the social gospel. Okay, what Rauschenbusch needs to do in this book is he needs to come to terms with evil. He needs to come to terms with the reality and the chaos that World War I has produced uh, upon culture and upon Christianity. And so he realizes that things that he said in 1907 were very optimistic compared to now that we're living through World War I. And so he tries to do that in this book, and he's really forced to do that in this book. Now, what he says, if you compared Rauschenbusch to Lincoln, uh, would be a very interesting comparison on a contrast. Remember we said with Abraham Lincoln, uh, the Civil War, it was, not, um, it was not an easy kind of way to navigate why we have a civil war. You know, the, here's the good guys, here's the bad guys. Um, well, that's, a, that's an easy way to look at it. But the nuances that Lincoln proposed for overcoming the Civil War were kind of a corporate guilt and a corporate need for repentance and confession if we're going to move forward. Well, Rauschenbusch does the same thing, um, that um, he believed that total evil is not found in just one nation. There's enough evil to go around with all of the nations. There's enough evil to go around with all of the people in this world. And so he says that the ultimate cause of evil in terms of corporate evil is two things. So let me mention the two things that have ultimately caused the evil that we are living through here in 1917, theology of the social gospel. Number one is what he called the lust for unearned gain. The lust for unearned gain. And Rauschenbusch said all nations uh, uh, demonstrate that lust for unearned gain. Gain that they have not earned and they are lusting after that gain from other nations and from other peoples. So that is problematic as far as Rauschenbusch is concerned, and all nations have that. Uh, there's not, there's not a, there's no, nobody exempt from that. The second one he talked about was imperialistic powers. Imperialistic powers. All nations uh, share that kind of imperialism and that desire for colonialization. It's just not one nation that does this, and so here's the good guys, here's the bad guys. We all share, he felt, in that kind of corporate evil. So the beginning of theology of the social gospel is um, let's, let's acknowledge where we are today. We're in the middle of a chaos. Um, we know that it has destroyed some of the hopeful signs that we had, um, you know, in nine, that I had, Rauschenbusch would say, in 1907. We know that. Let's face that. Um, head on, and let's try to let's try to deal with it. So, okay. So now another thing about the book where he goes is he now in the in the rest of the book now he holds out hope for the future, in spite of the chaos, in spite of the evil, in spite of what we find ourselves engulfed in now. There is hope for the future, no doubt about that. And what he wanted to do was he wanted to restore the notion of the kingdom of God. So in spite of the days we're living through, let's, we, we have hope to believe that we're going to come through this and that we're going to see the restoration of God's kingdom, in spite of how bad things seem to be. So he comes back to kind of his, his kind of kingdom theme and reminds people, which we try to do in that Christian theology course, reminds people that the Bible is not the story of good and evil, and we're standing back and wondering which side is going to win. Is God going to win or is evil going to win? Well, we're not sure. So we're, no, that's not the biblical record. That's not the biblical story for Rauschenbusch. The Bible is a story of God winning over evil. 
The Bible is a story of the conquest of God. So the hope, as far as Rauschenbusch was concerned, the hope in God's kingdom was a hope lodged in the Bible itself. So, very hopeful. Let's, when we come through this, let's see kind of the, the restoration of this. Then he also, in the book, wants to think through how Christians can especially be helpful in this restoration process. And he talks about Christianizing international relations. So one place he wanted Christians to kind of enter into the political realm and into the international political realm. He thinks that's a good place for Christianity after the war is over. Of course, we're still at 1917. He died in 1918, remember? Uh, But he's holding out good hope for Christians entering into political international relations and bringing the Christian message to bear on the broader culture. So that's very important for Rauschenbusch. So very hopeful book. Um, and, and obviously a helpful book as people try to get on the other side of this. So that's Rauschenbusch. Now, two names that we haven't mentioned, uh, just to conclude with Rauschenbusch. We mentioned Washington Gladden. We did not mention Adolf von Harnack or Joshua, Joshua Strong. So there's a couple of names you might want to just jot down. Von Harnack and Strong. Because both for uh, von Harnack taught at Berlin University, Strong was an American uh, theologian, but for both of them, um, they have a firm belief that Christian values can instill themselves in individuals and therefore can influence the broader society. So both von Harnack and Strong are big on that, uh, Christian values influencing the individual But then, through the individual, um, uh, 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 through the individual into national life, and of course, that's what um, that's what uh, Rauschenbusch hoped for as well. So there is a kind of congruence, in a sense, of people who are thinking similarly about these things. We mentioned especially how important Washington Gladden was uh, earlier, you know, for for Rauschenbusch. Okay, so that's a little bit about Rauschenbusch's life. You're reading the book. Um, if you aren't reading it one chapter a week, it's not too late. Get started, you know, because there's a lot from the book on the final exam. So I want to know that book really, really well uh, for the final. So are there any questions about his life? Kind of his life, his ministry, what he was all about, um, what motivated him to write and preach and teach and so forth? Um, remember the, the 11 years in New York and then going back to Rochester. Yeah. Yes, he taught with a, um, he taught with a, a helper. To, he, he was deaf, but he could still speak. And, uh, and, and so, so, but to, the helper make, made sure that he was articulating and so forth. And then giving the questions to him and so forth, sometimes writing them out. But he did have helpers um, uh, and it seemed to work quite well, even with large groups, because Rauschenbusch was so well known. So there was a demand for him everywhere to come and speak, you know, and preach or speak or talk about his books and so forth. You know. Something else about Rauschenbusch and about his life. Okay, okay. I hope you're going. I hope you'll enjoy the biography. It really is a wonderful biography. Okay, number B, the theology of the social gospel. Because Rauschenbusch gets this going, he's known as the father of the social gospel, he gets it underway. But then, what, what is the theology that came out of the social gospel? And then number C, contributions of the social gospel to American Christianity. Okay, first, f- top of the list of theology of the social gospel is something we've already mentioned with Rauschenbusch, but that's the kingdom of God. If I were to choose one theme from the social gospel movement, that was preeminent, it would be the kingdom of God. Now, as far as the social gospelers were concerned, Rauschenbusch included, but then people who followed him, um, the kingdom of God had to do not just with the community of the redeemed. It, It had a lot to do with that, obviously. But the kingdom of God doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop with the community of those who are redeemed. It doesn't stop with the community of those people who belong to the kingdom by faith. The kingdom of God 
also moves on from there to the transformation of society, to bringing society and bringing culture back under the umbrella of the kingdom of God where it belongs, as far as the social gospelers are concerned. And so they look for, this has, this is like a, um, for them, this is like a coin with two sides of the coin. One side of the coin of this is social action. And the other side of the coin for this, I'm sorry, one side of the coin is social reform. And the other side of the coin is political action. So social reform, political action, that's a coin with two sides, so you can't divide the coin in half, otherwise it's worthless, and you can't have one half of these things. You've got to have, have both. And so between social reform and political action, there are so, kind of signs of the kingdom work that are going on besides in the churches. And here are three signs of kingdom work that are going on, social, social reform, political action. First of all, government. You look to government and you see signs of kingdom work done in the government. Even though people in the government might not necessarily be Christian, um, but they, and they might not you know, articulate it this way, but they're actually working for kingdom results. So government is one, one place. The second place, of course, is commerce and business. Commerce and business, um, these, it's up to uh, theologians and social gospel theologians to remind commerce and business what they're, that they're, they're existing for the sake of the common good, and they're existing they're doing the work of the kingdom of God, even though they might rec- not recognize that. So, And the third is something we talked about the other day. I think it was through a question. But the third is very important for Rauschenbusch, and that is the life of the family. Family life, as far as he was concerned, was kind of the heart of it all. And uh, a very strong, and we talked about his own family life, and a very strong family life um, is really the, the foundation for kind of a, kingdom society. And so these three areas, um, uh, government, business, and family life, are three kind of community areas that are very important for Rauschenbusch. And we mentioned the other day, remember, he set up Rochester as kind of a model for how these things work together um, to help to shape the kingdom of God. So Rochester, for the rest of his life, after he moved back, this, this city becomes the model city. It's kind of like Calvin's Geneva, in a sense. Um, so there it is. So that's one thing. A second thing about the theology of the social gospel is the perfectibility of humanity. Social gospelers believed in the perfectibility of humanity. So social gospelers believed that this was, this was evident, as far as they were concerned, by the swift movement of Christianity uh, since the Reformation. When they look at the history of the church since the Reformation, they see Christianity moving and developing and shaping and so forth. And that becomes especially true in American life and culture. Because as far as they're concerned, the, the Christianization of American life and culture has been, has been really accelerating. It's been really rapid um, and that is a sign of the perfectibility of humankind. Now, um, I would say that second-generation social gospelers overemphasize this because Rauschenbusch was still evangelical. So on the one hand, he recognized the perfectibility of humankind, but on the other hand, he recognized the, um, the, the, the sinfulness of human beings as well. Rauschenbusch was able to keep the nuances here. But people who followed him weren't. And so they forgot the sin part, it seems, and they accentuated the perfectibility part of humanity. Uh, so, but there's no doubt that the, so, the theology of the social gospel really um, kind of zeroed in on this perfectibility kind of stuff. You know? So that's a second. All right, number three, a third kind of um, theology of the social gospel, and, and that is... Um, who, with whom does the church associate? The church, the body of Christ, capital C. With whom should the church associate in this world? You know, whose side should the church be on? 
Well, the social gospelers said that the church should ally themselves with the working classes. The church is on the side of the working classes. If the social order is going to be transformed, if culture is going to be redeemed, it can only be done through the forces of the working classes. And so religious strength and, and uh, uh, moral kind of strength coming from religion must undergird the work of the social, of the work of the working class, the job, the work, the ministry of the working classes. Because they are the ones who are going to kind of re- renew society, renew the social order. So, Okay, so who is in control of this then? Well, the church can help people by standing on the side of the working classes, by standing on their side, by supporting them. The church can ultimately help to control the work of the, the job, the ministry of the working classes classes. So people have to be involved in this. Now, under this point, the social gospelers emphasize not just personal sin. In fact, they kind of let that go, but we'll talk about that later. They emphasize not just personal sin, but the social gospelers were kind of a wake-up call to, to corporate evil. Not just sin of the individual, but evil of the system evil of the enterprise, Um, so systemic evil. So they started to address um, things like poverty, oppression, injustice, racism, and so forth. That's what they they felt was the work of the church, to not just talk about personal sin, but corporate and systemic evil as well. So, So those are, when you start to develop the theology of the social gospel, especially from Rauschenbusch on, those are... That is some of the theology. Now, before we leave the theology, I think that the, and Reinhold Niebuhr helps us with this, but that's later, so we don't have to worry about that today. But I think that as it developed, there were three really major theological difficulties that it got itself into. And I want to just mention those three. So that's under B, theology of the social gospel. Now that we've seen a bit of the theology, what are the difficulties of that theology? What are the problems of that theology of the social gospel? Okay, I think there's three, so let me just talk about those three. Number one, it is, it is really debatable whether they're understanding Jesus' message of the kingdom. Uh, the message of the kingdom was paramount to the social gospelers, but did they have the message of the kingdom absolutely right? Because I don't think there's any place in the New Testament where Jesus even hints that the kingdom that he's talking about is a political kingdom. I don't think Jesus talks about, I don't think he uses kingdom language in a, in a political way. Uh, I don't think he's, he certainly doesn't go to war against the political forces. He wasn't, he wasn't a zealot. Um, so I have serious doubts about whether they're understanding the kingdom of God the same way exactly Jesus understood the kingdom of God. So that becomes problematic because that is their major focus on the kingdom of God. Are they interpreting it correctly? Is their hermeneutics on target uh, correctly? And I think there are problems there. So, Okay, secondly, secondly, I think that the the social gospel movement... um, uh, is wonderful in accentuating some things, but once it, be, once it gets into that second generation, third generation, and begins to deny the reality of sin, of rebellion of the individual, the sin of the individual, the need for God's grace for the individual, all the kinds of things that Rauschenbusch still believed in and still held in tension, once you start to let that things, those things go, um, then the social gospel movement becomes a reactionary movement. It's not, it's not always that it's for justice, but it's a reaction against pietism and what they perceive to be um, a kind of a pietistic uh, strain in American Christianity. So, um, so that becomes problematic. Because in reacting against pietism, they're reacting against very, very critical uh, theological matters in the, in the Bible and in Christianity as well. 
So that's a second kind of criticism of the, of the movement. Um, I'm glad that it was for something, but a second or third generation is more of a reactionary movement um, against their against the perceived pietism. So, okay. And the third thing. Now Evans is going to come down hard on this third thing. So I'll just mention it here, and then you can, when you see Evans, when you read Evans, um, p please look for this. But a lot of the social gospel people associated the kingdom of God with the advancement of Western culture. So a lot of the social gospel people were very, very culturally bound people. And so if Western culture advances, they're interpreting that to mean, well, the kingdom of God is advancing. There's a difference between the kingdom of God and Western culture. And I think a lot of the social gospelers after Rauschenbusch didn't recognize that difference and those uniquenesses and so forth. So that becomes problematic. Um, if you're going to associate the kingdom of God with Western culture, then what kind of a criticism are you going to have of non-Western cultures? How critical are you going to be of non-Western cultures? How inclusive are you going to be of non-Western cultures uh, if you associate the kingdom of God with Western culture, with the advance of Western culture? This becomes problematic, and this is something that Evans will really kind of bear down on um, in his book. So. Okay, so that's just that's just number two here, um, the theology of the social gospel. So, yeah, Hannah. Right. Yeah, he is. He is the father of the social gospel, no doubt. The person that. Um, is probably most influential and, and kind of precedes him just a bit as a man by the name of Washington Gladden. And Gladden had started to talk about the need for social reform and so forth in Columbus, Ohio. He was a famous preacher. And, uh, and Rauschenbusch comes along and puts uh, remarks like that into more cohesive theology and so forth. So he is aware of Christian social thought um, and Roman Catholic social thought. <coughs> But we mentioned the other day that he is a bit critical of kind of hierarchical church structures because um, they seem to be at odds with a democratic, um, not only with a democratic uh, culture, but they seem to be at odds with kind of a congregational, more congregational culture of the Baptist, the Methodist, and so forth. So certainly he's aware of that, but uh, he's, he's a pretty... Um, he is an innovative person, Rauschenbusch is, as he's getting this from various, you know, hearing this talked about and then opening his Bible. Um, he's the one who really is putting this thing together for Protestantism. Uh, he's aware of Catholic social thought, but in terms of kind of Protestant thinking of this, he's the father of this social gospel. Yeah. But he's evangelical, as Evans will say. He's, he's very nuanced. He believes in personal sin, personal redemption, personal holiness of the individual, God's grace. But he also believes in take, you know, the unjust. We've got to do something about systemic evil as well. So you're able to nuance those things beautifully, I think. Yeah. He was a friend of Dwight L. Moody, as we mentioned. Um, he went to the prophetic conferences up in Northfield. So uh, he wasn't hearing much social gospel from Dwight L. Moody. Uh, no doubt about that. I don't know. Does that help a bit? Uh, and Evans also gets into a couple of these, uh, especially Washington Gladden, a couple of these influences. So. Something else, Rauschenbusch, and this theology of the social gospel kind of thing. Stuff. Okay? You all set with this? Yeah. So, do you believe He is looking for, that's more, he did have a doctrine of sanctification or a doctrine of holiness, but it wasn't as strict as Wesley. Um, because so he had a pretty high view of sin of people and so forth, but he did believe we are sanctified in a in kind of a process as we go through life. But he also believed what he's holding out hope for, kind of standing on tiptoes. He also believed that that kind of sanctifying perfectibility may come um, to the whole world. Um, you know, he was kind of almost a post millennialist in that way. So he had a he, even the second book that he wrote. He has high hopes for the future. Um, yeah, so perfectibility of human beings. He died still believing that, even though he died right at the end of World War One. 
something else about him or the theology stuff. You doing okay with this? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And imperialistic powers, imperialistic or colonizing powers, that is wanting to rule over other people. And, um, and, it's, and for him, as far as he's concerned, all nations share that sin. All nations have a desire to rule over the neighbor. So that's not just Germany. It's not just America. All nations share that, that pervasive evil. And he wants to recognize that for all nations. So does that help? Something else? Well, we stop. Take a five-second break. And then uh, we'll do C. So. Okay. One contribution that I think the social gospel really made was bringing, un- understanding what the impact that Christianity can make on the social, on, on social concerns. What is the impact Christianity can make on, the, on, on society and on social justice? So um, I think that's really, really important, and we're going to talk about some ways in which that can be achieved. Now, it is very important in American Christianity because even though Finney emphasized social concerns along with evangelical concerns, the person who followed him, Moody, Dwight L. Moody, great evangelist, great revivalist, but much more pietistic of the individual, a pietism of the individual. And, and Moody had a great influence on American Christianity, especially American Protestantism. So there tended to come into American life this kind of individualization of the gospel. And Rauschenbusch knew that by going to the prophetic conferences in Northfield, by knowing Dwight L. Moody and so forth. So the good thing, one of the good contributions of the um, social gospel movement is to kind of shine a light on corporate aspects of evil and sin and so forth. So. So, what kind of social injustices came to light? I'm going to mention five of them, and uh, that uh, that they uh, that came to light because of the social gospel people. Uh, we're grateful to them for that. Okay, number one, the first thing that came to light, of course, was very bad working relationships between capital and labor. Um, horrendous um, working relationships between the owners and the workers. And the social gospel movement got a light going on here and to see what is going on and how can we how can we work on this. Second thing, and you're not surprised because we've already in a sense mentioned these things, second thing, unfair wages. The social gospelers remember we mentioned the Brotherhood of the Kingdom the other day, Brotherhood of the Kingdom. Brotherhood of the Kingdom brought to light unfair wages. Number three, poor working conditions, of course. And we've already kind of talked enough about that. Number four was unfair working hours. Uh, Remember, it's hard for us to remember, but in the time of Rauschenbusch, people worked 14, 16 hours a day, sometimes seven days a week. Um, Try that out uh, sometime, Um, standing at a loom for uh, 14 hours, seven days a week. You're pretty bad. So uh, unfair hours. And then finally, um, number five is kind of a, a summary of all four, but that is the plight of the poor. The plight of the poor. Um, the the acknowledgement of the social gospel people is, let's acknowledge this. There are a very, 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 very few extremely wealthy people. And they've made that money on the backs of millions of, of poor people. So, uh, so we have to remember that. We have to kind of bring that to light. That is, um, that is, um, important. Now, under this fifth point, you'll see this in Evans too, under this fifth point. Rauschenbusch kept asking himself the question, how can we encourage wealthy people to help the poor? How can we um, do I have a word here? Convince. How can we convince uh, the rich to give to the poor, to alleviate the sufferings of the poor? Is there a way to do this? 
Is that the job of the gospel? Is that the job of the pastor? Is that the job of the minister? Is that the job of the church? To convince the rich to give, to uh, help with, help the, with the ministry toward the poor. How can you do this? Is it possible? Or are the wealthy so, um, so isolated in their own world without any knowledge of what is happening among the poor? Are they so isolated that they, they, they would have no understanding of what is going on here? So. Now, in that way, um, it's like the slave trade in England. Remember we talked about the slave trade in England. How did they, how did they finally overcome the slave trade in England? Well, they, they made the issue of slavery, um, they brought the issue of slavery into the face of the wealthy. And uh, you remember the little clip that we showed, um, the little video that we showed about that. So, so that's one thing. Okay, so that's the first thing. It, the social gospel focuses attention on the corporate aspects of life, not just the individual aspects of life or religion. So that's number one. Okay, number two. The, the social gospel movement influenced um, uh, major places in America, major groups in America, um, to have studies in theology and ethics. So it influenced churches, it influenced seminaries, it influences college, colleges, to uh, inaugurate studies of, of, Christian, of these very kinds of things, um, theology and ethics. And those studies crossed denominational lines. Um, so these were not limited to just the Baptist or just the Methodists or just the Congregationalists. The study of theology and ethics crossed denominational lines. It had a good way of kind of a gluing together various denominations in American Christian life. So that, that was true not just of churches but of seminaries as well. So uh, three, number three, finally, denominations, do not hold denominations start to uh, um, have offices of social ministry. So whole denominations started to take on um, social ministry as kind of a project, as a, as a biblical and theological project. So Number four is really important, and that is uh, the social gospel movement began a lot of institutional life that was important for the poor. Um, schools, daycare centers housing, um, but they, they started to take on a lot of hospitals. They started to develop institutional life, but the institutional life was first you know, and foremost helping the poor in every way possible. So, um, so it really tried to help out there. Now, um, this, boy, okay, so helping the poor, daycare centers, hospitals, schools, in every way possible. Um, there was a there was an interview on television about two years ago that was really hard to watch, because the guy on television the, the guy on television was trying to make a case for what we have to do is we have to separate social ministry from churches and from religious groups and so forth. We have to separate. We've got to get these churches out of the way of this ministry we're trying to do in the cities. If we could just get the churches out of here, we'd be in good shape. And then when he was questioned, of course. Um, about this. He said, well, see, the churches have never been involved in this. So now all of a sudden, the last 20 years, they're muddying the waters by starting daycare centers and hospitals and so forth. Now, what do you do in the face of such absolute ignorance? I mean, what do you do? do you, 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 yeah, it was just unbelievable. The ignorance of this person that was trying to get faith-based groups out of the work of, you know, so... Because in a, because the case can be made that the reason America is so rich in daycare centers and schools and hospitals and so forth is, it, it, they're so rich in that, not because of government, it's, I feel I'm sorry going on now, but they're so rich in that, not because government has instituted those things. It's because in the history of American life and culture, it's the church that has instituted those things out of compassion for the people. That's why we have daycare centers. That's why we have hospitals. That's why we have uh, institutions for the poor and so forth. So uh, who do we thank for that? Well, one of, one of the groups we have to thank for that is the social gospel movement because it wasn't just social gospel was not just an, a, a philosophical idea that they had. 
They put it into practice, and they cared for the poor in those kinds of ways. And we're, we are where we are today in American uh, uh, cultural life, largely because of these people. So we're grateful for them. So I don't know. When you hear people talking like that, it's just an ignorance of American Christianity total um, and an ignorance of, where, of the help that they have provided for the poor. So, so we're grateful for that. So, so lots of social services, if that's what you want to call them, uh, so came in because of the social gospel movement. And finally, uh, the social gospel movement also had an impact upon um, the missionary work of the church. There had been, um, not everybody, I'll say this very clearly, not everybody, but with a lot of missionaries going out in the 19th century, their sole concern had been with saving the souls of those people that they ministered to, which is fine. That's part of the gospel. However, um, through the social, the social gospel uh, really had influence on colleges, seminaries, um, on pulpits, on churches. And people started to see that missionary work is saving the souls of people, but that's not, that's not all. So missionary work is agricultural missions. I've written down three, agricultural missions, medical missions, educational missions. So agricultural, medical, and educational, those kind of corporate understanding of the work of the missionary um, is largely because of the social gospel people. Um, so saving the soul is fine, but you know uh, it goes along with agricultural, medical, and educational ministries. Now, the, the whole theology that undergirded that was that when you deal with people, you have to deal with their themselves as persons. So you do no you you do not value them if you're only dealing with them spiritually, because they have physical needs as well. You're valuing those people when you recognize their physical needs, their medical needs, their agricultural needs, their educational needs. You're, you're valuing them as people. But on the other hand, you do no service to those people if that's all you do, if you just help them physically in some way, unless you also help them spiritually, you're, you're devaluing them as persons. So there's kind of a holistic gospel here that um, people want to try to hold on to in a sense. But the social gospel people reminded us that uh, missionary work is not just saving the soul. It's also helping people because you value them. It's also helping people uh, physically in those kinds of ways. So there were contributions of the social gospel movement in America, no doubt about it. Influence upon seminaries, churches, colleges. Um, there, were, there were lots of contributions in spite of some theology that I think need to be called, in question, called into question. Okay, lecture number uh, 15, social gospel in America. Any questions here? Any questions? Social gospel in America, very important. Rauschenbusch, very important. That's why I have you read a biography of Rauschenbusch. Very important. Yeah. Yes, there were actually, um, there was a reaction to the social gospel movement because people saw that second or third or fourth generation of social gospelers not being faithful to the message that Russian Bush, Russian Bush was preaching. And so I wouldn't say there, that there were more denominations that picked up on it. I would say that within denominations, you had divi uh, some division in the ranks about how far should you go in social ministry. Um, you know, how, how far is too far or whatever. So I'd say that it, I'd say that's what you got. You had some movements that were very tied to this all along, and part of this whole movement, the Salvation Army certainly was one of them. The Quakers were another movement that was very, very important for the Quakers. Um, so you had that, you had that too. But so you had some division in the ranks over this, I would say. Yeah. Now we haven't yet talked about fundamentalism, but that's kind of a reaction to the social gospel movement, among other things. Other questions, a social gospel movement, very important here. Okay, we'll just get this started. Um, we'll just get this going, and then we'll 
Uh, we'll pick this up again on Wednesday. This is lecture number 16 and the top of page 15. Uh, this is lecture number 16 on top of page 16. Okay, so here we are. Lecture number 16, Neo-Orthodoxy and the Social Crisis. Neo-Orthodoxy and the Social Crisis. Okay? Okay, there's a long background here, and we're, I'm not sure that we're going to finish this whole background here to New orthodoxy and the social crisis, but let's get it started here. Okay, first of all, a definition um, of neo-orthodoxy, the new orthodoxy. Let's give a definition. Now, uh, you know, I should say that labels, we've got to be careful with labels. Labels help us to identify people, but we don't want to just put people in a you know, we don't want to put people in a box. And you understand that. We've used labels in the course, like social gospel. We don't want to put people in a box, but it helps us to make some identifications. Okay, neo-orthodoxy, the new orthodoxy. The new orthodoxy is, um, is a group of people who, a 20th century mainly, 20th century theologians, who are committed to the Bible, they are committed to the biblical message. They think that the, there's a strength in the biblical message. And they know that Protestant liberalism has watered down that biblical message. Protestant liberalism, because it's taken, taken hold of an extreme biblical criticism, has really watered down the biblical message, or even done without the biblical message. And so these people want to bring us back to the message of the Bible um, and uh, the strength of that message. All right, now the question is under this first thing, under this definition. The question is this new orthodoxy. Um, how are the, what lenses are they going to use to interpret the Bible? We've all, we all interpret the Bible in various ways. They're going to use the Reformation as their lens for interpreting the scriptures, and especially with many of them, they're going to use John Calvin. Calvin is going to be um, the person, among other reformers, but Calvin's going to be the person that they will use to help them understand the greatness and the glory of the biblical message for the 20th century. So it's the new orthodoxy, um, and what you want to take note of is, in a sense, not, not to the way that it was in the First Great Awakening or not the way that it was in the Puritans. But what you want to take note of is, in a sense, it is Calvinism brought back into the American Christian experience. And this would be the third wave of Calvinism, wouldn't it? Because we saw it first with the Puritans, then we saw it with the, um, we saw it with the First Great Awakening, and then we see it again somewhat with neo-Orthodoxy. Not not to the extreme of Puritanism or the First Great Awakening, but so Calvinism, Calvinism as a kind of theology comes back into the into some consideration here. So, okay. Now another thing we want to take note of um, the uh, the New Orthodox people felt that America had been American Christianity. We're talking about Protestantism here because the Roman Catholics are, and the Eastern Orthodoxy are pretty much a world unto their own still, in a sense. New Orthodox theologians felt that American Christianity was seriously divided and there was a big gap that was left in this division. Okay, on the left-hand side of that division, so I'm facing you, this looks like it's going to be on the right-hand side. So on the left-hand side of that division is... Protestant liberalism. Protestant liberalism, of, of, according to many of these new orthodox people, Protestant liberalism was pretty much bankrupt. Protestant liberalism had not produced um, the, its promises. And so on the left-hand side is Protestant liberalism, and it's not giving the people what they promised to give the people. It's really not, there's not much there. We'll talk about that much later when we talk about uh, fundamentalism, evangelicalism. Okay, on the right-hand side now, there is a movement that is has be began at the end of the 19th century, coming into the 20th century, and became very strong, and that was American fundamentalism. Now we lecture on fundamentalism later on, so we won't worry about it here. But American fundamentalism is on the right-hand side, and God bless you. And American fundamentalism, as far as the New Orthodox theologians were concerned, American fundamentalism was not producing on its promises. 
American fundamentalism was too rigid. It was too cultic. It was too narrow. And so it wasn't producing on its promises to be biblical, a biblical Christianity. Okay, as far as the New Orthodox theologians were concerned, that left a gap. That left a huge gap in American Christianity. Those were the two choices that people had. Should I be, should I, should my church be liberal or should my church be fundamentalistic? Which should we be? The New Orthodox theologians come along with a strategy. And their strategy is to appeal to the broad middle Protestants in American life who are disaffected by liberalism and who are disaffected by fundamentalism. Let's make an appeal to them. All right? And what is the appeal that they're going to make? The appeal is we've got a sound biblical theology and we've and we're and we're giving you that theology in a very carefully prescribed intellectual way. So there's an there's a real appeal to the intellect here among the neo orthodox theologians to the life of the mind. So we've got the Bible, we've got we want to interpret the Bible critically and carefully through the use of our minds, and um, and that appeal um, in a sense won the day because many people were convinced uh, neo orthodoxy was right. So now with that um, appeal. The neo-orthodox theologians allowed for uh, certain things to go on. Uh, so I'm going to mention four that they allowed to happen in the broader culture. Okay, so here they are. Number one, they allow for scientific freedom. All truth is God's truth. Follow that. Follow scientific. Uh, scientists should follow the truth wherever they find it. Science is not the enemy of religion. Science is not, um, um, is, it's just not the enemy of religion. It's not the, it's not at war with religion. Now, for a lot of people in, in middle, middle of the way in Protestantism, uh, in America, they, that made sense to them. So, okay, that's number one. Number two. And here, this becomes a bit problematic, but they did allow for biblical criticism. They felt that the way to deal with biblical criticism is to deal with it intellectually and not just to see it as something that is going to fight against uh, Christianity all the time. So they allowed for biblical criticism. Um, so they felt that the liberals were too um, loose on biblical criticism. They felt that the fundamentalists didn't acknowledge any biblical criticism at all. And so, but they're going to allow for that. So that's number two. Okay, number three. They allow for and indeed embrace the development of urban culture. They're not running, this was a, New Orthodoxy was a movement that was not going to run away from the challenges of urban life. A lot of Christians were running away from that. A lot of Christians didn't want anything to do with it. This was evil as far as they were concerned. Not for the New Orthodox theologians. We allow for the freedom of urban life, and we want to see how the church can embrace the culture, um, the urban culture, and minister to the urban culture. So that's number three. So, all right, and number four, uh, they allowed for, and indeed were critical of, as we'll see, uh, pretty heavily, pretty strongly critical, critical of um, the social and the economic structures of American public life. So they allowed for criticism, economic criticism, social criticism of the, uh, of the structures of American life, the political structures, the economic structures, the business structures, and so forth. So they allowed for criticism of that and were pretty critical themselves um, of that because they saw that as non, they saw that as unbiblical. So they were not happy about that. Okay, this is just a beginning. So we'll talk about New Orthodoxy for a couple of days. This is an important group of people. So have a good day. This is Dr. Roger Green in his teaching on American Christianity. This is session number 20, The Social Gospel in America, Part 2.